Good afternoon and it's a pleasure to be here and to be part of ABES 2013. I'm heading up our session today on new rural industries and it's my job to give you the overview. I'll leave our other two speakers to share with you their real life examples of industry development in Australia. So welcome to our world. When you first hear about Rurik or when you first walk in our door, it can seem a bit like this. How can we possibly pick winners from the vast choice of new industry opportunities which knock on our door? I hope for the story I will tell you today that you will leave our session with an appreciation for the important work that Rurik does to identify, foster and develop emerging rural industries for Australia and to give you some insight into the opportunities for Australian producers embodied in some of these new industry ideas. My presentation today will provide you with the overview and some of the statistics about emerging industries, introduce you to our life cycle approach and how we use that to guide our investment in this space, talk about some of our challenge and conclude with three examples of prospective industries for Australia and look at how RDNE can help those industries. Some of the industries I'll talk to you about today are not industries in the traditional sense and that's really important to note. They may be a plant or an animal where there's some research undertaken which demonstrate they have some prospectivity in Australia or it's a product that a pioneer has taken on who thinks it has real potential here in Australia. At this stage these are far from industries. It generally takes up to 10 years of groundwork, research and trial and error for these new industries to become established, even in a small way. But of course, it's from these germs of ideas of potential that new industries emerge, grow, succeed, fail or transform. These range from no novel animal uses or plants which have recently arrived in Australia or which have the potential to be adopted here in Australia, or it's a return to growth that, of an industry maybe that's been sitting here in Australia for a small way for a while, but for whatever reason there's been factors working against the development of that industry. When those factors change, we then see those industries step back onto the development pathway. The attributes of these industries, Rurdick can identify around 80 emerging industries in Australia at any one time. They produce a vast array of products from both plants and animals, and the participants in these industries are similarly diverse. From large scale enterprises that are looking for diversification options, through to urban and lifestyle producers. They are similar to established industries in that they are export orientated. And they, like the established industries that we heard about earlier today, face the same pressures from strong competition from imports or they're actually emerging in Australia with a desire to produce a locally produced product to compete with that import. So the industries that we're talking about on the animal side are things like alpaca, buffalo, camels, dairy sheep and goats, kangaroos, crocodiles, freshwater crayfish and malloway. In the animal industries we're often talking about a new use of an existing animal rather than bringing a new animal into Australia which is really quite difficult. Some of these industries have lesser or greater prospectivity than others. For example, at the moment there's quite a lot of interest in dairy goats as we continue to look for alternatives to cow dairy products to meet consumer demand. In the plant industries, the list is really very long and very diverse. We're talking about grain seeds such as chia, guar and quinoa, which you're gonna hear about today, along with olives, coffee, tea tree, culinary herbs, dates, cocoa, stevia, truffles, wildflowers, essential oils and native foods such as bush tomatoes, kakadu plum and native pepper. And for those of you who don't know about kakadu plum, it's Australia's own superfruit. It's very, very high in vitamin C and high in antioxidants. So on to the national value, and I need to acknowledge ABEARS for this data, we will be releasing in the next month a report that brings together the status of all of the emerging industries in Australia, and that's being undertaken on my behalf by ABEARS. So in terms of national value, we're talking about GVP of $762 million, or 2.1% of total farm production. 
and export revenue of 456 million. So compared to some of the export figures we heard this morning, you'd have to say these are pretty small industries and why do we bother? Well, of course, the national picture is only one part of the story and you actually have to look at these industries at a regional scale within enterprises and with communities to start to appreciate their importance and their value. Small industries can really contribute to regional tourism growth. So in southwest Western Australia, which is based on its wine growing reputation, we're seeing expansion into gourmet foods. So in that region, you can now go down and buy truffles, olive oil, goat and sheep cheese, green tea and maron. These new industries can be really valuable within Indigenous communities for economic development and employment opportunities. So the kakadu plum that I mentioned earlier is predominantly a plant which is wild harvested by Indigenous communities and they're looking for opportunities to gain economic development from that fruit. New industries can offer substitution alternative to enterprises where maybe they're not doing so well. So on the north coast we're trying out Mulloway with corn farmers. The beauty of this is that Mulloway can pretty much be adopted within the infrastructure of the corn farm themselves, so the farmers are not actually having to make major capital cost changes to try out this new option. They respond to new dietary needs, so for example we've been hearing noises about the potential for investment in African foods to respond to changes in demographics within Australia. They offer alternatives to consumers with food allergies and intolerances offer niche opportunities in terms of producing products at alternative times of the year, environmental opportunities where you may be looking at an economic benefit from pest control, and through diversification, opportunities to adapt to climate change. So that's why Rurik sees benefits in these industries, and as Danny said in her introduction, what I'm now going to talk about is what Rurik uses to make sense of this space in terms of where we should be investing. We identify that most industries follow a life cycle in terms of their development. They start at being embryonic, which is that germ of a new idea, and they move through to being new. In the embryonic and new space, these are things where we're looking at their feasibility. Can they be brought into Australia? Can they be grown in Australia? Is there a pathway to market for that sort of product? And could we actually be competitive growing it in Australia? For those industries that pass through that feasibility um, drafting gate, we then invest in them in terms of being developing industries. And industries can sit in the developing phase for a long time. These are where we're undertaking work to establish things like consistency of supply, address quality issues, come to terms with production within Australia. And at this time you'd hope to see a gradual increase in the number of participants in that industry. Industries then th move into a maturing phase and this is where you have some identifiable industry characteristics. You would hope at this stage to have an industry representative group which is actually starting to more actively engage with us about what the research and development needs are of those industries. And then they become established and these are the industries who have made it. The reason the life cycle is very important to Rudik is that we have to make sure that we invest in the right research and development for an industry depending on its development stage and ensure that we invest in R&D at the right time. And this is important because R&D can make a very significant difference to the development story of an industry. And you'll hear a bit about that from Pat when she talks about the tea tree industry and the role of R&D in that industry. But of course R&D is not the only factor that will influence the development of an industry. And there are also issues around pathways to market, regulation, pest, weeds and biosecurity issues, competitive advantage and industry cohesion. And when you have these factors at play and if they're actually working against an industry development, investment in research and development may not actually be what that industry needs at that time or may not actually assist that industry to develop. So here's a couple of examples of industry life cycle experiences to demonstrate what I was just talking about. So for example, coffee you would not say is a new industry in Australia. It's been here since the 1890s and 1920s when we actually had quite a viable coffee industry here. But faced with high labour costs and intense competition from overseas, 
you'd have to say the coffee industry stalled for quite some time. It was through the adoption of innovation from overseas, when the Brazilians developed mechanical harvesting, that we actually saw coffee start to redevelop within Australia. We are now observing increasing plantings in the coffee industry and renewed commercial interest. And with that is coming some growing interest in research and development in the sector. Of course, Australian coffee will really very much always be about a quality and a niche product rather than mass production. But given that we import 41,000 tonnes of coffee a year into Australia, and we currently produce 3,000 tonnes, you'd have to say there's potential for the industry. My second example is buffalo, and this is a story about potential transformation around the, along the life cycle. The buffalo industry to date has developed on the basis of meat and exports. Unfortunately, the industry faces a number of the issues that we're already seeing played out in the beef industry at this time. So there's some potential, though, in this industry for them to transform towards buffalo dairy. And we have a few pioneers in the industry already doing that. This is in response to demand for the true mozzarella, which is based on the Italian Neapolitan formula, which uses buffalo milk. Research and development could play a key role here, because what the industry needs to transform is breeding programs and new genetics from overseas. But this one is a wait and see story for the industry, because there are regulatory issues, and the definition of buffalo is something of a problem in some of our states in terms of how this industry might develop in the future. So I've talked about how we make sense of investment in this space, and I just want to briefly talk on about some of the issues that Rudic is facing um, as we work with the new and emerging industries. We are the leader of the primary industry standing commitment, standing committee research development extension framework strategy for new and emerging industries. What this actually means is that we lead investment in this space. As you'll have picked up from my talk already today, this is a long-term and a high-risk space. And picking, willing, picking winners is a real challenge. What we are also observing during this period of um, a very tight economic situation, where we're seeing cuts going on through government agencies and agriculture departments, we're observing basically a moving away from the new and the emerging industries and a consolidation of resources around our large industries. Unfortunately, the small industries are the losers in this process. But if we don't resource the emerging industries, where will the next canola come from? And will Gua, which you're going to hear about today, ever achieve its potential? Rodic is now the primary funder in this space, and demand is far greater than resources. So we depend on our life cycle to help us make decisions about which industries to continue with and for how long, which industries should no longer receive our DNE funding, and which industries should receive new funding. Unfortunately, we can't keep adding to the list. So to fund new industries, we must allow some of them to move on. I'm now going to wrap up my presentation by talking about three industries which we think are very interesting for Australia and offer some prospectivity. And again, come on a range of that life cycle that I was talking about. So 2013 is the UN International Year of Quinoa. And quinoa is a superfood. It's gluten-free, high in protein, antioxidants, minerals, omega-3, calcium and fibre. It's not new in a global sense. The Peruvians domesticated it 8,000 years ago. And along with corn and potatoes, it's been a staple food in many countries around the world. It's now readily available in our supermarkets and health food shops. And both Coles and Woolies reported a spike in demand for quinoa last year after it was featured on MasterChef. Quinoa is attractive in Australia because it's a very adaptable plant and it can grow in a variety of soil types and climates, including in marginal soils. While quinoa prices are steeply increasing, mostly driven by that gluten-free attribute. For example, in the US, in the last five years, demand has increased by 30%. So there is a potential market opportunity. In Australia, the opportunity is again in that gluten-free status. We currently grow about 50 hectares with an organic grower in Tasmania and a group of grain growers who were featured here in the story in Narragun, Western Australia, looking to expand and commercialise quinoa in Australia. 
Rudik is working with this group and undertaking research and development investment in quinoa. And the interest in R&D for this plant is actually about can we develop it through to broad acre production in Australia. So a big challenge of course is can we achieve the cost of production that will make quinoa competitive uh, with the rest of the world. With a current retail price of around $30 per, $30 per kilo for the thresh seed, certainly these growers are seeing a potentially valuable proposition for their enterprises. My second example is stevia. The recently updated Australian dietary guidelines created a fair bit of controversy when we were all told we needed to limit our added sugar. But with the stats like these, it's probably not a great deal of a surprise. Now stevia is a very interesting plant. It comes from South America. And what it offers is no calorie, high intensity sweeteners, which come from the leaves. One of the key selling points of stevia is that it's naturally produced, unlike the artificial high intensity sweeteners that we use in this market. It can be used instead of artificial sweeteners in a wide range of food and beverages. And we do have stevia in a major company, low calorie drink in, here in Australia, which has reduced sugar by 30%. Stevial glycosides have been extensively used in Japan, China and Brazil. And in 2010, world production was 3,500 tonnes, but that's ex expected to grow to 11,000 tonnes by 2014. The International Sugar Organisation in 2012 released a statement to say that stevia in 2010 replaced consumption of around 800,000 tonnes of white sugar. There's quite a broad potential growing region for stevia in Australia. It's the coastal regions of New South Wales and Queensland, temperate inland of New South Wales, and the warmer areas of Victoria, Western Australia, and South Australia. It's particularly interesting for irrigation farmers and can be used as a diversification crop, for example, in veggie growing, dairy farming, and summer crops like sorghum, cotton, lucerne, and maize. Stevia is one of these industries that isn't an industry in Australia. To date, the interest in stevia in Australia has resided mostly within the research community. However, the role that Rudik's playing here as an rd &E investor is to bring together the researchers along with Sanitarium for the first time to actually encourage a commercial partner to invest in growing stevia in Australia. And the last example I wanted to show you is something really completely outside of the square and I wanted to talk to you about something in the animal industries. So this is alpaca immunoglobulin. I hope I keep being able to say that. And it's actually a proof of concept study that Rudik funded um, with the alpaca industry. It's looking at the potential to use alpaca to produce medical grade therapeutic antibody products. Alpaca are members of the camelid family and camelids produce a particularly high class quality and stable version of these immunoglobulins. Why are they interesting? Well, they're used in a diverse range of medical products, such as antitoxin serums for snakes, spiders, and bacterial infections, along with some emerging anti-cancer therapies. At the moment, uh, animals like horses, sheep, and rabbits are used to produce these products. But there's interest in camelids because of that high quality nature of the antibodies they can produce. Australia turns out to be an ideal location for this because Australian animals have one of the lowest disease risk profiles of animals around the world. And we have 130,000 alpaca. So the early stage research has demonstrated that you can actually um, produce these antibodies with the Australian alpaca. But of course, it's very early stage. But what we've done is a proof of concept. And so this is now out in the marketplace with the industry, and maybe they'll attract commercial investment. We'll have to wait and see. So that's all I had to cover today. I hope that you take from my presentation that there's many exciting emerging rural industries out there. And what we see is that they'll often emerge and development, develop in response to community, consumer and society demands. It is a high risk space and it requires long term investment, but they do offer a strong value proposition, particularly at the regional scale. We are the primary funder of public funds of research and development in this space. And I just have to say, if you've got an idea, then you should probably come and talk to us. Thank you.